the last part of this second module, we'll discuss some more Cisco IOS configuration, um, and we'll round it out in the next module, the third module, with some actual Cisco switch configuration. But for now, we're going to stick with generic IOS configuration. One of the things that you should consider as a network engineer is configuring SSH access to your switch or router. Um, and actually, it's a bit more involved than most people realize. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go over the process of configuring SSH access to a device. And hopefully, by looking at this process, you'll gain a better understanding of how the iOS works in general, um, some configuration commands, and so forth. So I'll let me go through this process real quick. The first thing we have to do is specify a database for login. That is where the SSH server needs to go to authenticate usernames and passwords. Next, we'll specify transport input. In this case, transport input designates what kind of inputs are accepted to the device. Obviously, SSH is what the kind of input we want. Next, we'll have to add users, either on the local database or on some remote uh, login server. Next, we'll need to configure a domain and generate a key pair. Uh, the domain is actually required to generate an SSH key, so you have to configure it first. Finally, we'll uh, activate SSH and test connectivity. So the first thing we'll do is specify a login database. For our purposes, we want the login database to be on the same device uh, that we're actually establishing the SSH sessions to, and so we're going to be placing login information in the running configuration. It's actually possible to have login credentials on an external server. This is done through uh, two different protocols. One of them is called RADIUS, another one's called TACAX. Um, we won't be discussing those for this exam. So here's the actual configuration you'll need to apply to get the uh, yes, to get the virtual terminal lines to look at the local running configuration for the usernames and passwords. Basically, you specify the VTY lines you want to configure, and you say login local. Next, we need to specify that we want to use SSH as the only input type. Um, by default, Cisco will accept only Telnet connections. Um, again, transport input is the command that we'll use that lets us specify what methods of connectivity we want to use. You can specify if you want to more than one transport input method. For example, if I gave the command transport input Telnet SSH, what would happen is it would accept both uh, Telnet and SSH uh, connections. For our example, we only want to allow SSH, and this is the more secure method. So we want to specify again. You see the login local that we just entered. We'll also want to specify transport input SSH. Next, we'll need to add users to the local database. On Cisco IOS, this is done with the username command. So by default, usernames and passwords are stored in clear text. This is a very, very bad idea. So we want to turn on service password encryption. Um, so these are, uh, again, the username and password command. You can look at this here. Um, I've given a few examples. There's one, there's another one. So these are just a few examples of how you can configure usernames and passwords. So to enable password encryption, to prevent these passwords from being displayed in clear text in the configuration, what we do is we basically encrypt the password. Cisco uses a proprietary scheme. I'll said this once in a previous presentation, but I'll say it again. This encryption can be reversed. There are sites out there on the internet that will do it for free. So be very, very careful when giving out your running config, even if your passwords are encrypted. So let's look at this command. The command is simply service password encryption. As soon as you enter this command, all of your passwords will be encrypted. Generating RSA key pairs, um, the idea here is that we need to configure a domain so that the, the key can be generated and then actually generate the key itself. So uh, the size of the key, uh, that is the modulus, determines how easy it is for uh, uh, some potential host to attack it. Typically, you'll want to generate a key with a 1020, modulus of 1024. Um, normally, this is just you know a pretty standard thing. So let's look at the domain name. To configure a domain name, the command is IP domain hyphen name. Example.com is the domain I use here. You could use absolutely any domain you want. This domain is only locally significant. And so I've seen everything from very simple domain names like LAN to uh, domain names that are actually used on enterprise networks. Um, finally, to actually generate the key, the command is crypto key generate RSA. Optionally, you can specify the modulus, and you see that I've done that here. Now that SSH has been configured, we can move on to some of the other interesting features associated with login. Um, in this case, let's look at banners. So banners are displayed when you first log into a device, and there are different banners that are displayed at different points. So we can display text when the user logs into a device or enters privileged mode. Um, 
Normally, these manners use what's known as a delimiting character. Basically, what happens is the command will read up until it hits, sees that delimiting character. As soon as, see, as it sees the delimiting character, it stops reading. Now, I've decided to use hash or pound or octothorpe or whatever you want to call it as the delimiter for this particular example. So let's look at some examples here. Um, there is the banner MOTD. MOTD stands for message of the day. Um, and this message of the day banner is basically displayed uh, for frequently changed messages. It's usually displayed before the login banner. Banner login is displayed before the user actually attempts to log in. Um, and so you may prompt him, to, uh, please log in here or something to that effect. Banner exec is displayed after a user actually logs in. Um, and so this is a cool banner that you, where you can display, you know, information about make sure you write your changes to memory or something like that. Again, I've used the hash mark as the delimiting character here. And basically what, what would happen is, say I configure banner MOTD hash mark, this is a test hash mark. It will read all of the characters in my message, in this case, this is a text, and then stop when it sees the, ne the next hash mark. We can also look at uh, one of the more interesting features, command line history. You can access command line history by pressing the up arrow key, or you can use the show history command. This is very, very useful if you want to recall commands that you've recently entered. For example, recently entered show commands, recently entered configuration commands, and so forth. So you can actually configure the size of the uh, number of history commands that are stored in the buffer um, with the history size, number of commands, or terminal history size uh, for individual BTY line. Other useful commands, um, we'll look at exec timeout. Um, a lot of times when you're doing labs, I would not recommend this in a production environment, you can set the exec timeout to zero, zero. And what this does is it prevents the uh, prompt from timing out from a privilege exec prompt and forcing you to log in again. This is very, very handy because most of the time in the lab environment, you don't need to worry about security. You don't want to have to log in multiple times. So you can set the exec timeout 00, zero and what this does is it basically prevents the uh, exec sessions from timing out. Um, obviously, this is a very, very bad idea in a production network because let's say you log in, you walk away for coffee, and you happen to forget about the logged in session. Some malicious user could come in and make changes, and they don't even have to worry about, you know, logging in. You've already done all of the hard work for them. Um, by default, the timeout is five minutes. The first number in that exec timeout command refers to the number of minutes, and the second uh, number refers to the number of seconds. By default, logging messages will be displayed on the terminal directly, and they'll happen to actually interrupt any command you may be typing. So um, I personally find this really, really annoying, and I'll usually turn immediately, I'll turn logging synchronous on. Uh, what this does is it uh, basically displays the command that you were typing again after displaying whatever log message it was trying to say. And so you don't get interrupted. Rather, when you do get interrupted, it actually lets you continue where you left off, as opposed to just interrupting you in the middle of a sentence. That just about wraps it up for the second module of this uh, presentation. If you guys have any questions, please let me know, and uh, I look forward to hearing from you on future videos. Thank you.